and he was always losing it. Like his, his assistant would always have to come in and find like the piece that was missing from the end of it. And he had to use that tape with the thing that came down. It was such a drag. But you wouldn't do like you couldn't imagine. You couldn't do multiple versions of something. There was like there was yeah. only one. It was like that was the film. It was put together, and if you wanted to change it, then you had to take that apart and make a different one. You couldn't have like fifty different versions of a commercial. It was like there was just the one. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Is like now, I mean, like I did a presentation last week, and we had literally fifty different. We had four commercials. We had fifty different um, things that we posted. You know, well, what if it's like? What if we say the voiceover, uh, say this tagline, or what if we don't say the tag? All that kind of stuff. You know. Does the client um, last through it, or do they just tune out and fight? It's all that? posted. You know, and oh, they I go and everybody download. That's the other thing. Is just the difference between. You know, messengering something and then FedExing it or faxing it and now right. uploading it and just you know the fact that you can show stuff many more times means you kind of have to. Right. Um, so I think that changed the process as well. Yeah, because in those days you could actually they was like, well, what if we wanted to change this? The client said, and we would say, well, you can't. Like now it's like you can change it, everything, so there's no can I see it tomorrow? Can send it in an hour? Just redoing it. Things seem to never end. Well, I think there was more faith in what we did as professionals, right. because I think what we did was more mysterious. Now I think it's yeah, more like you can see what's going on. Yeah, it's, more yeah, like it's sort of like Flickr. Everyone is a great photographer. Everyone's a great, you know everything you take. It's like, well, look what my kid did. This right. looks great too. It's a great photo. I mean, you don't have to know about f stops or lighting or you right. just point and shoot. You take a movie camera, you shoot. Yeah, and I think we also have much more of a tendency to show stuff that already exists as the basis for an idea. So like you say, here I found this on YouTube, here, here's right. here's something I made in Photoshop, whatever it is, so it's always, it's harder to get to a point where you show something that's completely different than nobody's ever seen before. Right. Yeah. So that, that makes things pretty different. But what's different too is, remember like, just the whole world of secretaries and even right. ty electric typewriter. I mean, even when I first thought I was just like a junior, I had a secretary, you know what I mean? <laughs> like to, right. I would always tell the you. the phone machine, you couldn't even get a hold of you. So we would be like, you'd have to go back or call from a phone booth and your secretary would say, this person called or that person <laughs> called. Then it was inter-office messages too. You would put yeah. it in an envelope. The, and the so yellow envelope with all yeah. the lines on it with a string that went around. But also, like, we were watching Kramer versus Kramer last week, and so that's, like, 1979. He is, I guess, like, an, an ACD, probably, an associate creative director. He has a secretary, you know, and it's like, every, you know, everybody, of course, had a big office. Everybody's wearing a suit and tie, <laughs> three-piece suit. I remember I got an IBM Selectric, my, my first job, and that was, like, the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and the loudest. Yeah, so really loud. But then it also had the, you could backspace and erase the word <laughs> one letter at a time. You'd retype it. Then I, I was not a very good typist, so I'd always, they would always, you know, the secretaries would retype the thing for you. And uh, I remember just, like, when we were young, having incredible offices. Remember the one that I had, and I had, like, a door, and, like, on, like the fire escape was, like, a balcony, and... I mean, even after that, I would have offices with like two couches in it and views of the water towers. And no, I remember my first job at Y and R. So I was like thirty, and I had all this like Eames furniture. I had a giant wooden <laughs> desk with these leather armchairs. I had my own laser printer in my office, which was like I was the first person to ever get that. <laughs> it was huge, and I had a secretary that was like my full time secretary, and um, it's a completely different scene. Also, markers was another thing. Like that was yeah. I remember I just. That huge, like, you know, if you got, like, 128 markers, I had that. a set. And that was another kind of chemical thing. I would pop those <laughs> things off. I would be dizzy, like, after two hours, like, wow, am I high from the cigarettes, the chemicals, the spray glue, the marker, what, whatever it is, you know. It was just, like, really. And the other thing, actually, what I was thinking, too, which you never see in an ad agency is a drafting table. I mean, they were kind of everywhere. A lot of art directors, you would have a desk and one in your office. You know, it had the little lamp with the arm over it. And it always felt more like people were artists then because you would have little jars with, like, kind of watercolors in the water. And, you know, you, you I mean, even just think of really pads and stuff. We always had, like, a supplies, room art full of, like, art supplies, giant pads and marker. And you could just kind of get whatever you wanted. But a lot of it was physical, physical drawing. 
going into the bullpen with the foam car and stuff, and you would, if you were going to make a crazy display, there was always the guy like Nick who could, who would build something, you know, like physically cutting all these things out, making a football field or goal posts and things. I just remember cutting stuff. Also, just yeah. like, I mean, I remember cutting myself a lot. And I was, just, I wasn't very good. Because you were high on markers and spray glue, no wonder. But I was never very good with a T square, but just like slicing off the yeah. edges of my thing, but just. T square. When's the last there? time you saw a T square? Mm. I have one actually. So that oh, was you know what? The other day I went into an art supply store. I was doing something, and they had the uh, that wheel that you would figure the proportion out the proportion wheel. wheel. And I was like, God, look at this! I hadn't seen this. So that's a wheel where you'd say like, this is how big it is, and then I want it to be that big. And no, we're not talking you, about your. It would give you the penis. percentage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it would give you the percentage of right. uh, how much you would. Have to make it. Yeah, like twenty-five and three eighths, and I have to make this down to eight and a quarter. And you would do that little magic wheel. Well, another thing was also tight books. Remember those books that had all the typefaces, and it would have oh, a typeface, and it would have every though. size of it. It would have every point size, and that's what you would also use to trace to make layouts. That was Remember crazy. that Roger Hines that worked with us because he he developed his own typeface, Hines. Hines so you would right. get paid a small percentage anytime someone ordered. Hines. So he would always, for his comp, say, "And can you order a Hines?" Hines he, would order. <laughs> he would probably get a check for like seventy-five cents every year from him, ordering his own typefaces. Yeah. You know, it was another thing that was kind of of that time and isn't now was d drinking. It's like during the day, because remember, like when you and me started, there was that guy Ray Brown, and I remember the first time, like he was one of those the only guy ever. So he was a writer, author, up there. He he would kind of do everything, do his own boards, do his like gluing, loosing, cutting. He could do everything. But I remember once, like I had to go ask him something, and someone said to me, "What are you doing?" I go, "Well, I gotta go show this to Ray Brown." And they go, "He's no good after, after lunch, one o'clock." Right check him tomorrow in the morning and I was like what's this guy talking about and then it took me a while I was so young and I go oh he's gassed like the second half of the day but it was kind of a common thing and you were kind of like wow that guy's a real artist and nowadays that just doesn't exist because then there was that whole other thing when the production guys would take you out to those kind of palm or those things where their paint pictures were painted on the walls it was they had a, like a certain power even the, the whole thing of retouchers too right because they were like... But that was always so corrupt, though. I mean, there were always guys, particularly at Wine Art, people were always getting arrested. Like, they would take out the, the head of, the, of art buying or head of production, they take him out in handcuffs because he'd gotten so much kickbacks. That... And it's funny, because now it's like, you know, it's done by the 10-year-old in your office. Like, right. can, can, can you retouch this and make it look good? And in those days, yeah, it was like always some Italian guy, like, with a slick suit, bringing it to some place where... Well, those guys are all, they all lived in like Bay Ridge or something right. like that. I remember they had the huge mansions that were paid for by retouchers and type suppliers. And they kind of, that thing just kind of went away overnight. It was very odd. It wasn't even like a subtle thing. I remember like once one of those retouchers, he had called me and then suddenly he was like a rep for like a type house or something. I mean, he was something completely different than like from one day to the next. But also that was like a skill. I mean, yeah, the ability definitely. to like to do type and to do all that stuff. It's just weird that like a skill would be completely something that was probably like a hundred years people have been doing that for, right? right? And it was just gone overnight. Yeah, that's strange. Um, but I was saying to you before, it's like uh, with film also, the way that the process would work, you, because you couldn't just like do it on a computer and do a dissolve right. or, or do like really small cuts, you know, you had to... You had to send stuff out. So, so the editor would use a grease pencil and he would put an X across several frames and that would indicate that there was a dissolve, but you, but you couldn't really see it. You'd sort of see something. But then if you actually wanted the, the um, effect done, they would have to send it out and it would take sometimes three weeks before you got the dissolve back. But, you, but then you, they would take you to this place that was like a little mini movie theater in the, um, right. in the special effects house. And... No, the optical house it was called. And you would sit in a little theater on a red seat and they would play your commercial for you. Um, and the same with um, audio editing. Like when you'd go and do commercials, mm -hmm. radio commercials, they always had this big one-inch tape and the editor would have to do with a razor blade. He was like cutting this magnetic tape. Um, you know, it was...